I'm here with Nate Silver, the author of The Signal and The Noise, Why So Many Predictions Fail, But Some Don't. He's also known for the 538 blog for the New York Times, which accurately predicted the results in all 50 states for the 2012 presidential election. Nate, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, Conan. Uh, a lot of questions. First of all, when we called and asked you if you'd come here, one of the first things you said was you wouldn't be inviting me <laughs> if I had, my predictions had been incorrect. Probably, probably not, right? Statistically unlikely. Unlikely, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's probably about three to four percent. I'd be doing it, well, we had, we had Romney with a, with a nine percent chance of winning on election day. Right. Because um, there had been, toward the end of the race, you saw Obama gaining ground in the polls, whether because of Hurricane Sandy or yes. the relatively good jobs reports that we had. Um, but it was a close election for, for a while, right? And it wound up being close. I mean, Obama did not win by a landslide. Uh, by any means whatsoever, um, but still, it's you know. And I always make the sports analogy because I, I, I used to cover baseball before I got into politics, right? right? Where if a team enters the ninth inning with with the one run lead and they have a good closer, they're usually going to win. It's a yes. close game, not any guarantee, um, but they have a, a bigger edge than you might think from it being oh, a one run game or a close game. So the going into the election the night before, Obama versus Romney, you said that the president had a ninety one percent chance of winning. So uh, you were quite confident that that was going to be the result. If you were watching the media the way I was <laughs> in the days leading up to the election, forget the months leading up to the election, but, sure. but the days leading up to the election, that is not the impression that anybody had. It was thought of as a very close race. I'm in media. I talked to a lot of people <laughs> in media. Many people were convinced this could go late into the night. So why? Why does the media do that? Would well, they do it, even do they in, do it on purpose? Uh, I, sh I think to some extent, sure. I mean, look at their look at their incentives, really, right? The incentives are to to get better ratings, right, and to sell more newspapers, get more traffic on your website, and you say, hey, it's right down to the wire, going to come down to the last vote. That's a better it's a better story than when you have oh, this one candidate's probably going to win because he's ahead in all the swing states, right? Even in two thousand and eight, which was much less close than this year. Um, you had the four pundits in the McLaughlin group the day before the election said it was too close to call, right? And you really, you know, I mean, there was no way it was too close to call. You had uh, Obama ahead of McCain by, by seven or eight points in, in every swing state, pretty much. Okay, and, you, and we're going to talk about, there's noise. It's what you talk about in your mm -hmm. book, the signal and the noise. We live in an era where there's more noise than there's ever been before. Right. And noise is a distraction. And uh, obviously, w what you talk about in the book is that nothing helps more than data. The more data you can have, often, the better your prediction will be. The problem is we live in an era where there's <laughs> tons of data. You just can't discern what's reliable, what's not reliable. That's right. So if you have more data, it should make your life easier. It's more information about a problem, and so you can make a better decision. Uh, but people can have information overload sometimes where they don't know how to process this information. They haven't really trained themselves to do that. Or, or worse, if you have 400 different cable channels, then you have a lot of choices for how you consume <laughs> your information, right? Yeah. I'm um, just talking about before, a lot of those choices are, are not really giving you the most accurate picture that they can, but giving you a particular set of information that may mislead you, right? If you really were Based watching, on who they think is watching, probably Based on who they think too. is watching. If you really were watching Fox News every day during the campaign or going to the Drudge Report, say, right, then you would see plenty of polls showing Romney uh, ahead or tied, whatever else. They Surging. Would, yeah, because yeah, they would cherry pick the three polls out of 30 or 40 that would come out that day and highlight, and highlight those three, right? So if you were really in that bubble where you're not doing it, I'm someone who I do go ahead and, uh, and I watch Fox News and MSNBC and I read conservative blogs and liberal blogs. It's important, to, I think, to do that. But people, uh, it's so easy now just to kind of stay in your own little bubble and never venture outside of it. And it seems like people are doing that more and more nowadays. Well, I, I call that preaching to the choir. That's what I think most entertainment, most media is these days, is that you, you can have a satellite channel with 85 or 150 uh, different channels on it, and you can just listen to the music that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. You're never confronted with anything that you're not comfortable with. You can choose to watch the news that you're comfortable with. That's you can right. choose to hear the opinions that you're comfortable with. So what I think is that nobody's changing anybody's minds. Everybody's talking mm -hmm. to the people that agree with them, and no one's stepping outside of their little cubicle. So, And, and there are various ways to measure partisanship. You can, for example, look at how often Democrats and Republicans agree on anything 
in, in the Congress. And uh, it's becoming, I mean, there's been less and less partisan agreement um, since about 1970 or 1980, and that coincides with the rise of, <laughs> of cable television. It might just be a, yeah. a coincidence, but I think it's, it's uh, where people no longer have to actually go and have a civil debate and iron out their differences. They can just kind of retreat to their corners a lot more. I think it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty dangerous for, uh, for the democracy, frankly. Well, I think about, say, 1968, or I think it's 68, Tet Offensive, and Walter Cronkite goes on the news, and he pretty much looks into the camera and says, I no longer believe that this war is winnable. <laughs> and uh, it was a shocking moment. And Lyndon Johnson saw that and said, we just lost Walter Cronkite. This is debacle. Wouldn't happen anymore. Because Walter Cronkite was talking to liberals and conservatives, mm -hmm. you know, and he was talking to America. Nobody, I don't think anybody's talking to America anymore. Now there'd be, Walter Cronkite's people would probably know Walter Cronkite's opinion and be comfortable with it, but nobody who's uncomfortable with Walter Cronkite's opinion is going to be even watching him or caring what he thinks. Yeah, if people say, and this is the other unfortunate thing, right, where if you say something that, that people don't like, they assume you're on the other team, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they assume right. that you're some partisan hack, right? And I think, you know, look, I think journalists have political views and, and ought to have political views. If you're, if you're covering uh, a field and you don't have some opinions about it, it's a little odd, I think. Right. Uh, yeah, it's kind of sociopathic if you have no feelings whatsoever about the, about, about the field that you're studying. Um, but at the same time, I think it is possible to be a, a, to try and be an honest broker, at least, right? And just say, look, I'm delivering the data to you the best I can and, and you know, willing to back it up with, <laughs> with showing your work and defending your case. And that's what they do at, at, uh, at Harvard Business School, for example, right? Is uh, it's all about? They give you some hypothetical or sometimes some real uh, business to study, right? And you say, well, here's what here's what I do. And the professor doesn't care about that part as much as the next part, which is when he says, well, defend your ideas, right? Here are five critiques that I came up with of your ideas. Defend them. And we don't get to that level of depth very often. Certainly not with the kind of skimming the surface cable news punditry, right? Where um, where people say a lot of things that aren't really very defensible if they had to be a little bit deeper and they hope that anyone kind of calls them on on wanting to, to read the fine print. And I'm more of a detail-oriented guy. I think sometimes it's so easy to get um, different snippets of information now that we don't, we forget that you lose something when you make an approximation or an abstraction. Um, you know, it's not as good as, as flushing things out at, at greater length, I think. Well, uh, you were uh, chillingly correct on election day. Uh, you were right about uh, the outcome for President Obama. You were also right about all these Senate races. You got one Senate race wrong. We got two wrong, actually. Uh, you got two wrong. Yeah. Um, in North Dakota, we had the, the Democrat with only an 8% chance or 9% chance of winning, and, and she won, which goes to show you that we put those probabilities in there for, for a reason. It's just like you know that uh, in the NCAA tournament, you would not want to bet on the 15 seed to beat the 2 seed in the opening round, but you right. know it's going to happen one out of 15 times or so, or one out of 20 well, times? Well, it's, uh, it's one of the tricks if you say uh, that this is a, uh, you know, uh, you have a 99% chance of being <laughs> fine, a lot of people take that to mean that I'm perfectly safe. Exactly, and You need to right? point out, well, no, there actually is a 1% chance yeah. that you if my, will be if killed. My, if, uh, if my airplane back to, to New York, if they told me that, Nate, there's a 99% chance that the plane won't crash, then there's no way to get on that airplane, right? Well, especially when you find out that it's <laughs> flying 200 flights that week. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and Then you right? want no part of it. <laughs> All right, here's a question I have. Um, elections are probably some of the most dramatic moments in the history of our country. There's a danger that you're taking the fun out of them. <laughs> there's a danger that, is, yeah. that, that the great <clears throat> photograph of Truman holding up the newspaper, uh, Dewey defeats Truman, uh, and the entire nation had it completely wrong. <laughs> is that possible anymore? Is it possible uh, for the news media, or have we gotten to a point where we've broken it down, there's so much data, it's so closely studied, that we're gonna have no more dramatic election nights? Oh no, we'll have, we'll have a lot of dramatic elections, I think. I mean, look at the primaries, for example, where the polls did not do very well this year, or in 2008, you had plenty of states where Hillary Clinton was supposed to, to you know, have her sayonara after New Hampshire, right, and said she came back to win, you had this epic primary battle going back and forth for, for months and months, right? So those, those it's, you know, again, I go back to the sports analogy yet again, but um, the fact that you can, you have some sense of the statistical likelihood 
of an underdog winning an NCAA tournament doesn't make it any less fun, I don't think, really, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, I'm thinking about historically, you have campaigns. I don't know if your model would, and maybe you could tell me, would it have worked in the past? I know you've looked at some past elections, but 1980 is an intriguing <laughs> year because you have Reagan, Carter, Carter's the incumbent. Reagan's behind for quite a while and then has after a great debate performance, a surge and uh, it, get coming into the election and then uh, very dramatically wins the election, would, would that be possible today? Would you be able to, would you be able to track that? Do you think that that would, so would, thing, would an election like that happen again? Would your model have worked in 1980? So I'll give you a slightly technical answer. Okay. Which is our and model looks, And I'll pretend to understand. <laughs> so the model looks at both polls and economic data. And in 1980, the economy was, was, was really, really bad um, with 9 or 10% inflation with unemployment higher than it was right. last year. Um, you know, people think, oh, it's a slow recovery now. But this was a, a catastrophic kind of recession right in the middle of the election year that was very scary for people. So under those conditions, you would think that uh, the incumbent would have a tough time and that once Reagan kind of got on the stage and introduced himself as a competent alternative, then he might have done pretty well. So I think that election is one where you say, well, yeah, there's a point at which the polls click in and become more reliable. Yep. When you have a, a, a candidate who was kind of controversial up to that point, people knew Reagan maybe as an actor or maybe as governor of California, but he had run as the conservative alternative to, uh, to Jerry Ford in, in 76 and now is repositioning himself um, toward the center to be someone more presidential. And so once that clicked in, then he had a very good argument to make on his Behalf. And I, saw, I also think, and, and your statistics would probably bear this out, any time a challenger gets, shares a stage with a mm -hmm. president, you always see the, close, the, the, the polls start to tighten a little bit. Yeah. Because once they are standing in the same shot, two shot, with the president of the United States, and they've managed to show up, they're dressed, they're not drunk, they're not wearing a silly hat. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 immediately, people well, start to not, say, yeah. okay, this is, a, this is a reasonable alternative. I'm still not sure I'll vote for this person, but it's almost a, a human psychology takes over. I, I think so. Uh, I mean, although not, maybe if, if Rick Perry had been the GOP candidate instead yeah. of <laughs> Romney, okay. we would have seen what happened. But, but I think it's also the incumbent is, is rusty a lot of the time, right? Yeah. And you get the sense that, so I've done enough things where you have to go and, and talk to people now, right? Um, you're under pressure to perform, right? Yeah. Um, and people can tell when you don't want to, when you don't want to be there, right? When you feel like you're wasting your time, right? And Obama in that first debate seemed like he didn't want to be <laughs> on that stage, right? And that's just kind of that intangible impression that conveys. Um, I think was was pretty damaging to him, right? He kind of didn't bother to show up for for the job interview, and it wasn't like he made some gaffe. There was not really any one soundbite from that first debate that was replayed over and over again. It was just kind of the artistic impression part of it, kind of, that, um, that was wrong somehow. On the other hand, it kind of meant that the bar was, was lower for him in the last two debates as well. Right, if he just, uh, yeah, that was his chance to, surge. the media had its story that it wanted to write then, probably, which is Obama surges back. And That's right. He so needed to give see, them the opportunity to write that story. Yeah, you can see, I mean, so I think there were, there were, reasons, there were reasons after the convention where you had this bounce for Obama, right? You could kind of tell that the media was getting tired of of that story, right, and was ready to have a, another shift in momentum, right, and so, and Romney provided that moment. So I think everything gets a little bit exaggerated by, by the way campaigns are covered. Momentum basically means that the press is, is piling on in one direction. At some points during the campaign, it was helpful to Obama. At some points, it was helpful uh, to Romney. But you do have this kind of pile-on effect that, um, that can make these kind of one-off events have, have legs and last for, for weeks and weeks as far as the, the way the coverage goes. The, um, I, I'm, I, a lot of people are wondering, I know I'm wondering, that uh, it was reported that the Romney camp really thought they were going to win. Now, I don't know, in a world of spin, counterspin, counter, counterspin, are they just saying that to project an image? Do you <laughs> believe the Romney camp really thought, went into election day thinking they were going to win. I believe they wanted the press to think they thought that, right? But in, in reality, was Mitt Romney stunned that he did not win? Was he surprised, was he shocked, or was, was, did someone quietly take him aside on election day and say, well, look, this, so this wasn't, this wasn't 1984. If we, you know, were Walter Mondale, you know, he would have had a million to one chance. And Romney, in our estimation, had a 10 to one chance. Those 10 to one things do, do come up sometimes, right? Um, like if Romney was a good, 
businessman, right, and was, was looking at his campaign as a business, then he would have realized that he had had a bad last quarter, so to speak, right, where the polls had shifted toward Obama or last week the campaign. He hadn't really closed the deficit. Romney hadn't in the swing states. So, um, so he ought to have known. But for any of us, and especially if you're in a campaign bubble, doing honest self-assessment is, is really, really difficult, right? Um, and you don't want to be the pollster or the strategist who comes up to Romney and says, oh, you're probably going <laughs> to lose, right? Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know. When I, when I talked to the campaign a couple of months before um, this kind of surge they had after the debate, then they seemed to have a pretty realistic view of, of where they stood. But I think the closer you get to Election Day, the more uh, you get in a bubble, the more what you start off kind of, I mean, I think you have this chain where you start off kind of spinning things to people, right? And then you start to believe, to believe it. it, right? You hear your own noise. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, a, it's a feedback loop. Yeah. You're making the noise. You start to hear the noise that you're making. You start to believe the noise you're making. And then you start making more of that noise. Absolutely, right? And if you're the candidate, then it's hard to, uh, to get out and, and talk to, to real people, right? Where you're protected both for reasons of, of security and just the people that you're around. You know, one thing that was different this year is that you have more and more fundraisers with this kind of super PAC crowd, right? And, you know, I think that might have an effect on on the way the candidates approach the, the campaign, right? Where the a- average person that Mitt Romney was talking to was someone who was a, a very big Republican partisan, um, probably had a lot of money, right? So he wasn't necessarily hearing from, <laughs> from the common folks, I guess, as much, nor, nor as president was Obama. That's very difficult to do as well. What happens is the crowds are selected and then they're only playing for audiences that love them. Yeah, which so is this all is why performers, I- as a performer, I love that but you can get a false positive. Well, so I went to, uh, to New Hampshire for the primaries, and that's different because in New Hampshire there's a tradition that, you know, you might not be planning to vote for, uh, for Newt Gingrich or Mitt Romney or Rick Santorum, but they're open events, right? And yeah. so you'd have some, some hostile questioning from, from the audience, and that's very interesting to see that, you know? Rick Santorum, I saw an event where he was questioned on, on gay, gay marriage by a number of, of young kind of Republicans who felt very differently on that issue than than he did, right? And that was fascinating to see that. And uh, did he respond well to it? He respond. He tried to respond, right? But he didn't. I mean, he didn't have a. He, he was off his talking points. It's interesting to see how well a politician improvises when when he's off his talking points. You know, the kind of the true naturals, uh, the Clintons and and the Reagans, right? Will find some way to do it. And it is very much like a performance. Yes. I imagine, right? Where maybe you tell a joke and you can deflect things that way, or maybe you just kind of get what the person's really asking or find some way to defuse a situation. Um, you know, Romney wasn't bad when he had these kind of set pieces like the, like the debates, um, but he was someone who's used, I think, to being in, in control yeah. very much as someone who was successful at a very early age. And of course, it's great to be successful. And but business not, is a different world. But business, it's a different world, right? Um, and this is not a business where you're, you're like manufacturing widgets or something. It's a business where you're dealing with investments and, and capital and it's kind of a boardroom kind of a business, right? Um, And so it's not quite like you're out there dealing with people on the factory line and things like that. A lot of people, myself included, are wondering, uh, one of the reasons I think that you could be so accurate with your predictions is that you can focus in on these swing states. You can really zero in on them. And I'm curious, in 2016, Ohio, Florida, are we, are we going to be back at the same story again? Pretty much, I think. I mean, you pretty much have... And it, are, it we gets, st- are we stuck with Ohio and Florida? Well, you could have Virginia and Colorado, right? The, the new breed of, of swing states, right? But it's, it's, you're not going uh, to have Texas or, or Alaska or something suddenly become a swing state. These things are pretty slow moving. Over the course of many years, you know, it used to be that, uh, that Vermont and Maine were the most Republican states <laughs> in the country, right? So you have this kind right. of glacial change, almost like the continent's moving, right? And over the course of, of many years, then, then there can be shifts. But, but four years at a time, so it's So 2016, it's you think Ohio, Florida, those are still the maps. <clears throat> we're still looking at those two states on election night and breaking it down precinct by precinct. Unless you have some radically unexpected candidate being nominated, right? Well, when that's had, my next question. Yeah. Have you thought at all, if Chris Christie were to run for president in 2016, his popularity is such that suddenly New Jersey, which mm-hmm. has traditionally been a Democratic state for quite a while, that they vote for Chris Christie if he's running as you a could, Republican. You could, right, you could. Uh, that might you get change about your whole point. model. That's right. So if you do have a county who, um, a, a president candidate that you get, usually gets about a seven-point home state boost, right? It's like home court advantage. And so that could potentially make New Jersey more competitive. That's right, if you had a Christie running. Or just in general, the fact that if you had someone who, it's been a while since we had someone running from the kind of northeastern moderate wing 
of the Republican Party. Um, so that's kind of an untested <laughs> hypothesis, so to speak, and, and that could be a little different, right? Um, where maybe you would put states like, like Maine, for example, back in play. Maine, uh, after long ago, was Republican, but then became a swing state for many years and hasn't been very much competitive at all. But if you had a Republican who was more moderate on, on social issues, right, um, and still fiscally conservative, then you'd have a different template than you do right now, where they're kind of doubling down on every brand of conservatism. And so it becomes very polarized and partisan and, and predictable, basically based on whether you live near a coast or a city, you vote Democrat, or otherwise you vote Republican. Okay, so let's uh, create a hypothetical situation where the Republican Party, uh, you are partisan, or the Republican Party has made you partisan because they've come to you and they're paying you as their consultant. Would your advice, what would your <laughs> advice to them be for a Republican candidate in 2016 who has the greatest likelihood of defeating a Democratic Well, candidate? I think someone like a, a Christie would be a pretty decent messenger, potentially. I think a... a a Jeb Bush, but these might be the people that I personally think are, are seem like they're reasonable and intelligent people and have a forward-looking view for where the Republican Party should be What I'm headed. trying to get you to do is do what you advocate, which is divorce yourself from that. Yeah. Statistically, if you were to look at, do you think that, if you, would a model be able to show you that the Republican Party needs to move closer to the center, the Republican Party needs to uh, close the gap with African Americans, Hispanics? Is that something that a model well, here's, could tell I you? mean, the math is pretty, if you look at, uh, so under the age of 30, 40% of voters under the age of 30 were, were minorities, right? That's what the future is going to look like. By yeah. the way, half the people under 18, they're not voting yet in this country, are, are non-white now, right? Um, so what parties should do, classically, is, is you adjust to that. So yes, of course you're going to shift to the center a little bit on, on immigration and, and gay marriage, which are two issues where the younger cohort feels much differently than, right. um, than older voters do, right? Maybe uh, drug legalization, a few other issues like that, right? Um, that's what a rational political party would do, and if it does that, then the GOP... Look, I mean, Romney ran against a, an incumbent who, at the end of the day, had a 50% approval rating, and you usually get reelected with that, and, um, and Obama has a very good campaign operation. It's tough to beat an incumbent, and Romney still got 47% of the vote, right? You know, it's not that far from... From 50 percent. And so um, so there's a rational road forward for the Republican Party. And yeah, of course, it's going to involve moderating on on some select issues and changing your tone a little bit. Right. And being a little bit more inclusive as a party. If they don't do that, then they could be in the wilderness for for some period of time. Um, right. But I'm, I'm oddly optimistic for some reason about their ability to take four years and and maybe finally get it right. I was just enjoying that you were advocating drug legalization while wearing a Cookie Monster t-shirt. Well, thank you. I, to, <laughs> I, just, just, I just enjoy that. Let's move on uh, to other areas outside of politics because the signal and the noise is about so much more. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that fascinates me as you discuss uh, data in this book, the value of data, the double-edged nature mm -hmm. of data. A lot of data can be a great thing because if you have it in certain areas, it can really help. We have much more data now about the weather. You talk about the weather, and you say that weather forecasting has improved tremendously yeah. in the last 20 years because we have more data. At the same time, too much data is a problem. <laughs> too much and data in the wrong hands is, is a problem, certainly. And again, you look at the kind of political pundits where it's almost like the more information they get, the more ability they have to, to spin and mislead uh, mislead you and, and kind of not tell the whole truth and cherry pick their facts a little right. bit more. Um, or if you go back to the days of, of the printing press, I talk about in the book, that was kind of the original information technology explosion. All of a sudden, people had, had books when it used to take right. literally $20,000 in today's dollars to transcribe a book by hand. And now you had a machine that could do it uh, hundreds of times cheaper than that. Right? right. Gutenberg figures out a way for people mm -hmm. to have books. Suddenly, more and more people have books. And, and that's when you start to see, <laughs> as you point out in the book, more religious wars. Yeah, right? Like, there's people more like, violence because more people can disseminate yeah. their opinions. People are like, people, this book disagrees with your idea, right? You're wrong, right? And all of a sudden, it's like when, you know, it's like a, a comment thread on the internet or something for the first time, right? right? Um, people really go after one another and they, and they feel they have more proof of their ideas now, right? And so, yeah, you, you had uh, um, the Protestant Reformation, um, uh, triggered in part by the printing press and the Protestant Reformation um, entailed for some period of time a lot of <laughs> holy wars all throughout Europe for you've got, centuries. Yeah, and you've got the Inquisition. You have yeah. terrible violence, misery, and it's <laughs> funny because clearly books are a great thing. Books, and of course. They books work. are great, but 
you have a graph that shows the minute Gutenberg starts <laughs> printing books and the more the average person can afford a book, uh, the violence and <laughs> the wars <laughs> go through the roof. Yeah. So um, I don't know how to feel about that now. We're, we're definitely living in an age of a lot of information. I had a personal experience with this uh, when I first started out as a television performer in 93 and there was a lot of noise just about me uh, taking over this television show and who is this guy. And every day I would get, uh, once a week we'd get these ratings about how we did the week before. And sometimes people would say, you know, your number dropped a little bit or you didn't start with as many viewers or you lost some. So maybe you shouldn't do that comedy piece at the beginning of the show. And I would be thinking, that comedy piece felt good and the audience liked it and it felt good. And they'd say, yeah, you probably shouldn't do that. It took a while, and I'm not in your field, but at one point, I found out that the sample size for a show that's on at 12.35 at night, and I don't know if it's changed now, but yeah. the sample size was tiny for the, for the Nielsen rating. So my rating was being affected by, I don't know, three people, the flu is going around, and three people didn't feel or well maybe you had a sleep. Lakers game that went to overtime. Right? right, exactly. There were things, and, and I thought, at a certain point, I said, I'm getting too much noise. What I need to really listen to is what feels right to me. That felt funny, that felt good, there was a good flow, but I became very aware at that point that I was getting information that was not helping me. That's it was right. not making the show better, it wasn't Well, and me look, and go. believe me, there, there are times when, uh, when if information is misleading and used to make bad decisions, then it can be worse than no information, right? I think the way that, uh, that education's occurring nowadays, where you have a lot of teachers who are teaching to these standardized tests now, right, right which are, are not necessarily tests developed to, to improve critical thinking skills, right, or analytical skills, but instead to memorize a bunch of, of facts and so forth, right? So now you have these objective measurements of teacher performance that don't necessarily benefit either the teachers or the children as well, much. It's the same thing you talk about in your book in the financial sector. Nobody thought about this at the time. I certainly didn't know about it. I didn't know that Moody's and Standard & Poor's were being paid, that, that they were making money to oh, give yeah. their ratings and that the greater volume of rating that they gave, the more money they would make. <laughs> it's the same thing you say. Once the system is tainted, gee, if we can get kids to answer these questions correctly on a standardized test, it's better for our school and for our jobs. Right. It's the same thing. Uh, all these uh, mortgage-backed securities are getting AAA ratings, but because it benefits the ratings companies to do that. And so what happened was the information we were getting, and like a, like a sap, I thought, that's AAA rated. <laughs> sure. I trust, yeah. we all become children at a certain point. I trust that dad or mom is taking care of stuff. I thought a AAA rating uh, was, I mean, that was really vetted. We now know that that was, nothing could be further from the truth. And it's tricky, I mean, we're learning that we have to be skeptical of a lot of different institutions, right, including government and, and business and, and many different things, right? And, and, at what, and at what point can you be um, have healthy skepticism without becoming a conspiracy right. theorist kind of nutcase, right? Uh, but I think if people start from the position of, of, of not taking things at face value, right, up to a point at least, right? When you hear something that a political reporter says that they heard from a campaign, like that's a good example of something which you shouldn't necessarily take uh, at face value. It's, it's intended as spin. Yes, the best reporters can, can sort through that and give right. you some nugget of truth. Um, but people are, are, are much too willing to take dubious information um, or to take unprecedented situations and, and not really kind of apply their own filter of, of common sense and, and so forth. Well, here's the bigger problem. Uh, I don't know what your feeling is on uh, Nicholas Taleb, but when I, when I started reading him a while ago, he introduced me to this idea that seemed attractive to me, which is that the human brain is inherently flawed, you mm-hmm. know? And I, and I liked, I found it helpful to remember that we are flawed. Oh, our sure. thinking is flawed, that uh, our brain, and that we are constantly, and I think this is a big part of your work, is working to counteract <laughs> the flaws of the human brain. Yeah. That, that we love to see patterns, even if there aren't patterns there. Yeah. We love, uh, um, there are certain ways of thinking that really benefited us when we were trying to escape a leopard, uh, <laughs> when we were hiding in a cave. Not so much now. Now it can get us into trouble. And so it's trying to counteract the organic flaws that are in our mind. Well, look, you, I mean, do you subscribe to that? Absolutely, right? I mean, we're, human beings are very smart 
creatures, right? Um, but relative to the overall amount of information in the universe, right? I mean, that's the kind of crazy thing about it, right? Someone says, well, my subjective point of view, you know, it's truthful and you guys are all wrong, right? I mean, you know, how can you say that when, when you're just one person that's like literally this gigantic <laughs> universe, right? It demands, I think, some, uh, some humility and you look at the way we did things, uh, you know, how we treat disease 300 years ago with leeches <laughs> or whatever now, right? And probably 300 years from now, they'll think that chemotherapy is something incredibly... Barbaric. Barbaric yeah. and primitive, where you make someone sick in order to make them healthy again, right? It'll be seen as barbaric, potentially. Um, and, you know, and if you follow the history of, of knowledge and the history of science, then, then it is humbling. As cool as like, we think that our age is now, the thing I can guarantee you is that we're going to have more and more technological progress in ways that we frankly can't anticipate very well. Well, um, we're going to have, they're going to finish mapping the human genome. Yeah. And I think, talk about computer analysis, uh, statistics, people were very close to a time when a baby's born, you prick their finger, you get a sample of their blood, and you find out that, yeah, you're going to have colon cancer yeah. when you're 55. What does that mean? It, it, and, and what are the choices that we make then? So talk about more data. We're going to have a lot. We're only going to have more and more data. Well, see, but there's the thing. There is something that where you kind of take the fun <laughs> Out of it, right? Is, the you fun know. of getting colon cancer at 55? <laughs> You're right. Well, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but some people like to do the uh, 23ME things, whatever, where you have your, 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 the odds of every different disease. I mean, I, I do think there are people need some, some peace of mind. And by the way, you know, the reason that we, have, we forget things, um, you know, having better memory is helpful on balance, but forgetting things is also an evolutionary response, right, to allow our emotions to process uh, through difficult periods, right? Um, and right. so that's part of the issue is that our brains have many different modes that operate in it, and it's not, it's not always in scientific analytical mode, right? Sometimes it's in emotional rage mode, right? And that can cloud your judgment potentially, though it's also useful for, for different reasons. Um, but, you know, people need to be just more, more critical of, of themselves, and, you know, trusting your gut sounds very alluring and and sexy, right? Like, oh, just kind of trust your gut instinct and have faith in yourself, right? Um, it sounds it's a very romantic idea, but um, but people who who use that kind of judgment when they're processing through too much information, through very difficult problems, tend not to do as well as those who who slow down and take their time to to parse through the facts. Right. Well, I'm curious about uh, baseball. Obviously, sports a big part of your life. Baseball uh, was changed forever by the whole money ball uh, uh, approach mm -hmm. to, to baseball that was chronicled by, by Michael Lewis. And there's a, it, it seems that baseball works well in this world because there's a lot of data. There's and, a lot of data. And it's pretty controlled. It's the, the diamond, the, <clears throat> pretty much the parameters of the field, where they're playing. Um, and that feels like a world that responds well to data. Yeah, and baseball, everyone kind of takes turns, right? It's this guy's chance at bat, and he hits the ball to one player, and the player throws the other player, right? So you have these discrete elements that you can quantify a lot easier than you can in a sport like, like football, for example. You have 22 players on the field who are in motion together. Um, basketball is somewhere in between where, right. uh, where guys are kind of standing around but positioning for the rebound of everything else. In basketball, you've seen some progress with, with using statistics. Um, but baseball is this kind of perfect laboratory environment to study how statistics work and how probability works and how randomness works. And so a lot of people, uh, I think, you know, basically I think they should uh, have kids who are learning statistics, like just go study baseball, right? Instead right. of learning the theory, get your hands, uh, have a hands-on experience with, you know, try and build like a rotisserie baseball team or something, right? People think I'm joking when I say this, but I think it would like literally help kids learn more, just like when you're actually um, trying to learn about the English language, you read, you read books, right? You experience things. You or experience you immerse literature. yourself in that culture. If you're yeah. trying to learn Spanish, you, mm -hmm. you go to Mexico, you go to Spain, you immerse yourself. That's right. Um, instead of just saying, well, here's a, here's a pronoun, right? And here's a, no, you kind of learn it through, through, uh, through feeling it out, right? What's well, clear also that you're a believer in putting your money where your mouth is, that that <laughs> helps, that betting on whether it's your, your uh, rotisserie league or uh, putting a little money down on baseball gets you, or, or when you're playing poker, gets you immersed in probability in a way that's more visceral than if you were just looking at it on the page. Yeah, it's hard to play poker if you don't have any money <laughs> on right. the line, right? You don't have any, as many incentives to play, to play seriously, right? And that's, the, and that's the good thing about 
business, by the way. I'm not like the biggest rah-rah free market guy. I think it's, it's the least worst system that we have. But the one good thing about business is that they are putting their money on their line. If you have a dumb idea in business that might sound good in the boardroom, you might persuade people, but if the product doesn't sell, then it's not going to do you a lot of good in the long run. Um, so, uh, you know, investors even put their money where their mouth is, and poker players do. For some reason, it's seen as very odd if you want to, um, in news coverage, say like, hey, look, you know, I believe in the analysis that we're doing, and I'd be willing to, to make a gentlemanly wager <laughs> on it. Um, then it's like, oh, we can't, we can't do that. But I think, I think it has to do with the clash between um, what journalists think of as, as objectivity and what, <laughs> and what kind of scientists might or what, what poker players might or, or how other people might approach the problem, where, where in political journalism, objectivity just means that, um, that you recite each side's talking points for about the same amount of time. is kind of this, this workaround right. that developed in practice, right? Um, whereas the way I define objectivity basically means, means being true. It means that there's a world outside of the way I view things, right? And when we have a test, if we make a prediction, we're testing how well does my sense of how this external world looks correspond to, to the genuine article. Um, and if you're someone who is always making bad predictions, that means your subjective filters are distorting this objective reality a lot. And so well, I think that was what was, uh, regardless of your politics, the election day 2012 was nice to have uh, a result. We oh, finally, sure. we waited all this time, we got a result. Obviously gratifying for you because you called it, but all these pundits were saying all kinds of things. It was on tape, so you could go back and look at it, and then... <laughs> The, uh, the election happens and you get your result. And I think that's the, that's the release of baseball, poker, you get your result. And in business, which leads me to my next question, <laughs> uh, financial crisis, government steps in and intervenes, which in a way is skewing the game a little bit. And I don't know how, you, you know, in, in terms of, uh, people talk about moral hazard. Does that mean that, sure. that as, as we move forward, if this really is a game, if you and I are playing poker and it's a real game and you lose and I suddenly slide some of my chips over to you, we're changing the whole framework of the game. Look, capitalism is, is very, very good at taking advantage of opportunities in the system. And by the way, with, with the internet now, it kind of is the same thing, right? Where if there's something that's, that's going wrong, if someone else is not doing something in the marketplace where there's money to be made, then someone else will, will step in and fill that vacuum, right? But that means if you design systems that have bad incentives and, and bad rules, and you can kind of almost guarantee that, that someone will be willing to trade these financial instruments that, that are risky and that ultimately um, that the taxpayer is bearing some of the risk unless you regulate them in the right way. And there is too, such a thing as too much regulation, I absolutely believe, right? right. But, um, but at the same time, yeah, you know, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be shocked when, when, uh, when capitalism figures out how to, how to sell snake oil, right? Um, between everyone in the world, if someone doesn't do it, then someone else will step in and, and fill that void, potentially. And so, you, can, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm not saying the financial crisis was predictable, but it's predictable that, um, that you're going to have, uh, that the appetite for risk will move up and down, and that, um, and that you'll have companies that are, are very aggressive about um, pursuing the next big right. commodity that might or might not be right. And you know, by the way, you know, I think that in the end that you need risk-taking ability. I, uh, I just wish there were a way that the taxpayer is, is more insulated <laughs> from that, potentially. Well, you talk about in the mortgage crisis for every, I think you were the first person that I read who made this point, for every $1 in mortgage, mm -hmm. the financial markets were making $50 in side bets. Yeah, yeah. For, uh, which, uh, and a lot of these side bets are being made in milliseconds because we live in this computerized world. So when you realize we were leveraged to that point, uh, you'd think that it would have been predictable, that this has to fall apart at some well, point. Well, of course, it's always easier after the fact right. to go back and say, uh, oh, well, of course, this is kind of, this is what happened. But look, I mean, a lot of people understood that the housing bubble was going on while it was going on. If you go, if you went to Vegas at any point during, <laughs> during the housing bubble, right, you could see houses being built as far as the eye could see. And it's, right. in, and it's, it's in desert with a town that's a one industry town, right? Or like, Florida. Or, or Florida, I mean, right? Yeah. Um, not places where, where land was inherently scarce necessarily, right? Um, it was just pure speculation. By the way, if you look at the number of people who actually owned homes, it increased only slightly, I think from like 56% to 59 percent, right? Which meant that it was people, speculators buying second and third or 20 and 30 right. properties. Um, and it wasn't really tied to 
a fundamental increase in, in prosperity like you had during the 50s, for example. Um, but, um, but people, you know, if you see the green arrows going up on, on, uh, on CNBC, you see housing prices going up, it's very hard to, to resist that, right? Your instinct's like, oh, this is good. I'm going to keep making money. I want to be money. part of this. I want to be part of this. Ride the hot street. People are worried that if I don't buy a home now, then it'll be impossible to afford one in, in 10 years, keeping up with the Joneses kind of thing. Um, and then it all comes crashing down. You know, in the end, <laughs> in the end, I think, uh, you know, people usually get what's coming to them if they make bad bets, but it can take, it can take years or decades sometimes. Um, and if you were someone who, uh, you know, bought um, some of these crappy tech stocks, for example, during, during the dot-com boom, right? Um, yes, they eventually crashed, but if you had cashed out on just the right day, you would have made four or five times your money if you, had, right. if you were that prescient about it in advance. Uh, global warming, I wanted to ask you about. That's, uh, we obviously have data, but do we have enough data to make a, a real prediction? Where, do you, where, where are you on global warming? Here's what I'd say. I think if you look at what the UN reports actually say, right, they have different levels of, of certainty. Um, and the kind of first thing they said, and the first report they did in 1990 is, all they said was that, hey, we know the greenhouse effect exists and it's going to make the planet warmer, right? right. And in some ways, it's kind of all, all you need to know, really, right? It's when you get to the specificity of saying, well, what's this exact scenario for when will, you know, when will there be flooding in, in lower Manhattan or how will this um, jungle be affected, right? That stuff, there's a lot of uncertainty about. There's also a lot of hyperbole. Obviously, magazines love to put the Statue mm -hmm. of Liberty underwater right. on the cover as if to say we're 25 years away from you need to take a rowboat to get to your third floor. Mm -hmm. And that's where, obviously, there's a lot of emotion taking over. There's a lot of yeah, people so extrapolating. In the, in the 1970s, you had, uh, you had uh, Newsweek, I think, publish a, a cover story on, now we're going to have the next great ice age, right? right. Um, and now people say, well, that proves that uh, that you know, climate scientists don't know what they're talking about, right? In fact, that was not a minority. That was a minority view, right? right. That there were one or two papers on that. And it's right. more or less about the way the press covers this stuff, right? Where um, this piece of this journal article, which was not mainstream science, really, um, is a lot more interesting for a cover story than <laughs> than one that says, "Well, we're not sure. We probably the greenhouse effect will probably get warmer, but it'll be twenty or thirty years from now, right?" Which is kind of the consensus view back then. Um, but that doesn't sell. It doesn't sell magazines, whereas the next ice age and the River Thames freezing over and everything else uh, uh, does. Well, it's a famous story of the any doctor that wants to get on the evening news <laughs> needs to say children are going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they want, it, you know, that's what they need to say. And if they say, well, it's complicated, and you know, my father is an infectious disease scientist, and whenever a news crew would come by and he'd talk to them, a local news crew, he'd say, well, you know, he'd say, what about this outbreak? Well, it's, he'd give a nuance, <laughs> you know, it's interesting, you know, da, 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 and they would film him for a while and they would leave. And he would say, hey, I'm gonna be on the news tonight, and we would watch, and he wouldn't be on the news. They had found a different guy who of said, course. you're all dead. Yeah, <laughs> Everybody's yeah. dead. Within yeah. a 50 mile radius, dead, dead, dead. And so <laughs> uh, that's uh, obviously a, an issue is that we're, we, we like stories. We like dramatic stories. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, yeah, so you have, uh, but you know, there is money to be made, I think, literally, if you are someone who understands how to process the details. If you have a culture of people who, who are told, oh, trust your instinct, you'll make great judgments. Well, look, I love playing against those people at the poker table, right? right. You know, in the long run, me or, or other players who are even better than me um, will take, we'll take their money. The guy who kind of wanders in and says, well, I can read your soul and tell that you have only a pair of sevens, right? Um, look, there are a few people, maybe 100 people who can really have very good ability to read other people's tells and emotions, but for the most part, they're just, they're just fooling themselves. It's much less about that than we've been led to believe in James Bond's Casino Royale. Yeah, you poker, it's mostly, so most of the, of the reading that you're doing, what, what poker players call ham reading, is just making logical inferences based on, well, you know, you raised now, and then you just called, so you probably had a good hand, and some card made you scared that I had a flush say, right? So you can narrow down the probabilities a lot just based on, on people's betting patterns. Um, the way they might be behaving um, might give you a few clues at the margin. But remember, good poker players, um, they'll either be there, they'll either have good poker uh, faces or they can give off false <laughs> tells, right? right? Um, and so you have a whole cat and mouse game, and, and for the most part, um, following the, the kind of math, mathematical logic of it is probably, is probably 90% of it. The, the, the reading someone physically is, is, uh, is worth something. You look for any edge 
you can get, but it's probably 10% of it at most. Uh, clearly, a lot of things you're passionate about. You're passionate about sports. You love poker. Um, and you read your book, and you realize, oh, this guy, this also guy really enjoys math. You know, we, do it. <laughs> uh, we differ on that one. But uh, are you passionate about politics? Do you, do, you, do you vote? Do you care about politics? I didn't. Um, I, you know, I have my political preferences. I, I haven't voted since I joined the New York Times, which is not a company policy, by the way. It's just my kind of personal, my personal choice that if I'm writing about this event, that I don't want to simultaneously participate in that event, right? Um, so, uh, so you didn't vote? I didn't vote. No, no. I'm I'm not a likely voter. Or if a, if a pollster called me, they would have to. I would have to hang up, right? So like, I don't plan to vote this year. You um, could tell them I'm Nate Silver. <laughs> I, did I'm you, not voting. You no, know I'm I, Nate Silver. <laughs> I'm not voting, but I'll tell you who will win. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you exactly who will win. Um, we have a question here from. Um, it's a new thing called the internet. Oh wow! Don't get scared. It's going to be <laughs> fine. This is. Uh, Atelan from Twitter asks, which prediction from your career was the least accurate one that you got completely wrong? We tried to predict the, uh, the UK election in 2010 or, or 2011, I think it was, 2010, I think it was. And we had um, the Liberal Democrats doing well and the Tories doing well. There was kind of this big surge toward, toward Labor at the end, so that didn't go all that well. And how much of it is a cultural difference where you're unfamiliar with the English people? You're unfamiliar with yeah. their, their, their <laughs> habits, their mannerisms, how to read them, their personality. <laughs> is that where you think you, you went awry? I'm not sure if that was that much of it, but they have a, they have a multi-party system there, right? And the multi-party races, if you if people remember Ross Perot in 92, mm -hmm. that race had some crazy ups and downs where, um, where Perot kept dropping in and then coming back out. He was actually right. ahead for a while, right? But you had these big shifts when people are, have multiple choices. You have more different vectors by which the vote can move. And that's what happened in the UK is you had um, the Liberal Democrats basically were this uh, kind of centrist party. And at the end, people were like, well, they're not going to win, right? right? So they migrated back to their camps, and, uh, and that made our predictions look pretty foolish in the end. Um, How much does a third-party candidate change things for you? Does it... Does it does it throw your models out the window? How much harder is it? It'd be a lot harder to model. Yeah. yeah. If we had a true, it'd be very exciting, right? It's an interesting problem. Um, but one reason why the primaries in the early stages, like the Iowa caucus, is so unpredictable is because you have six different candidates, right? And you have Republicans or Democrats, right? And they're all within the same party, right? So, um, so it takes almost nothing to move someone's vote, and it's really only in the, in the few days before um, a primary. Actually, one thing this year is that. In, I think, seven of the first eight primary states for Republicans, the candidate who was leading the polls a week before actually lost, right? Um, wow. You almost want to kind of peak at the right time yeah. um, because once you start losing momentum and the press piles on the other candidates, pile on, you can kind of think of, you know, Newt Gingrich basically being a, a pinata for, <laughs> for the other candidates in the press for, at a couple different points during the campaign. Um, things can turn sour very, very quickly. Right. So it's when, you're, it's when you hit your stride that's important as, as hitting your stride at all. It's just as important, probably. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it has to do with the, with the timing of it. And in some ways, though, by the way, primaries are, are the better test because you have to perform consistently, right? Um, where you can't just win one state um, and then be elected, where you have to um, survive rough periods during the campaign. I think one thing that, that, uh, that frankly hurt Romney is that, you know, he was, he was playing the JV League during the Republican primaries, right? Yeah. We did not have a lot of their better, more capable candidates enter. You did not have a, a Christie or a Mitch Daniels or a Paul Ryan, for that matter, or a, or a Jeb Bush. Um, Rick Perry seemed to have a lot of financial <laughs> muscle and then, uh, and then just didn't quite work as a candidate right. uh, for a lot of reasons. He didn't have to play his A game until... He didn't have to play his A game as much, whereas Obama did. I mean, of the, of the kind of three... Um, wins that Obama has had, meaning beating Hillary Clinton in the primaries, beating McCain, and beating Romney. It's still that first one that was the most impressive, I think, by, by some margin, beating Hillary. All right, well, uh, the book is The Signal and the Noise, Why So Many Predictions Fail, uh, but some don't, and uh, it is fascinating stuff. And Nate, I'm really glad the odds of you coming here, I calculated, <laughs> being one in nine. So I'm the big winner here. I wish I had put money on it. Cool. But uh, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Conan. Yeah, really cool having you on the show. Uh, that was Jibber Jabber. See you later.